What's up guys? If you're new, I'm Natasha. This is Shepherding Peppers Farm. And today we're talking about what we are growing in the spring garden or the summer garden, basically the whole garden. So, so uh, there's a whole series on this that we've been doing over the last month. You can check that out if you want to. It's in a playlist called What Are You Growing for the Garden for 2024? And today we are talking about cold weather crops or things that I would typically consider your cold weather crops, things like lettuce, your brassicas, your kale, radishes, carrots, things of that nature. The reason I call them cold weather crops is because we are growing here in Horry County, South Carolina and growing zone 8B. And for us, those are pretty much cold weather crops. They're frost hardy. They're known to be able to withstand decently cold temperatures, which we don't really have unless it's winter here. Our spring season typically heats up fairly quickly and we don't regularly have the opportunity to grow a lot of colder weather varieties in the spring. Now we are having an unusually cold winter and because of that, I'm gonna roll the dice. I'm going to be growing some of our colder weather things this spring. Now, last year I did grow a few of them, majorly with the intended purpose to save seeds from them. So broccoli, for example, if you're a new gardener, that broccoli crown that you eat, that is actually the beginning portions of a broccoli flower. They produce these beautiful, tall yellow flowers that the pollinators just absolutely love. And before it actually starts to bloom, that is what you eat is that nice tight green broccoli head. Last spring, we were able to harvest a few heads of broccoli, but a lot of it went to flower, which was great. That was my intended purpose. I wanted to save lots of seeds and it worked out really well. This year, I am going to plant things out just a touch sooner than I did last year. Last year, I planted those things out majorly in the beginning of April with a lot of my other post-frost plants. This year, I'm going to put them out in March. That's my goal, and I think that should help a little bit, and we're just going to see what happens. Worst case scenario, I save a bunch of seeds. Best case scenario, I get a whole cold weather crop harvest in. It's up to Mother Nature and I'm just going to do what I can and enjoy what occurs. So on that note, if you are in a colder area, if you grow up north, you can probably grow a lot of colder weather stuff in the spring. You can probably do broccoli and cabbage and cauliflower in the spring. So there you go. That'll work out really well then. Let's talk about peas first. I love peas. I love snow peas so much. <laughs> My kids are chiming in they're like, I love peas too. Yeah, they're wonderful. Garden peas are amazing. Snow peas, they're just fabulous. So I do have several bags of seeds of peas that are not labeled, that are saved from the varieties that I'm going to show you here. Because last season I planted so many peas on so many trellises that I definitely went overboard. Now pretty much every year I can grow peas in the spring and we'll get a really decent harvest from them. And I hadn't in the past grown enough to be able to save seeds and I wanted to do that, but I got so tired of picking peas and trying to separate them that I just was like, I'm done, whatever. <laughs> so those are mixed up. However, of these varieties that are all mixed up, I have the green beauty peas. Green beauty peas are about five to eight inches long and they're very tender when they're harvested at full size and they produce really beautiful purple flowered vines. Now the majority of peas are going to need a trellis. They can have really, really long vines. I'm trying to see if it, this one says how long its vines get. It doesn't, but typically if you're talking four to five feet roughly on average, so you definitely need trellises unless a variety of peas says that it is not needed. Another variety of peas that I have in the mix, and I also still have a couple of seeds of this variety too that we're gonna be planting, is the golden sweet pea. So the reason this variety is gonna be a go for me is it's from India. It's supposed to be very rare and tasty, but it's known to grow well in hot, humid climates. I've had a lot of success with growing varieties, areas that are known to have very hot, humid climates because if they're in a similar growing condition, I'm probably not gonna have the same amount of success growing something from up north that prefers colder weather as I'm gonna have from an area that is used to having a lot of heat and humidity because it's very hot and humid here. So that's something that you wanna consider when you are shopping for varieties is if you know that you grow in a colder area where you don't typically get above 80 degrees in the summer. I grew up in Washington State on Puget Sound, the Puget Sound area and it didn't get super hot in the summer. We might have had a couple of days where it was like, oh man, I would really love some AC, but all 
we never had AC. It just wasn't something that happened. Here, if you tried to go without AC, you would have heat stroke and die immediately. It's very hot. <laughs> it gets very, very hot, very, very quickly and very humid. So, you know, I wouldn't try and grow varieties back north that preferred really warm, humid climates because that's not what it would be like and vice versa. These vines are supposed to be about six feet tall. It does say this on this packaging. So this is definitely one that you're like, okay, you gotta get a big trellis for that. These right here, the Lillian's caseload peas, these vines only get to about two to three feet and they contain five to seven large peas. Now this is notated on the packaging because although you could eat this while it was very small and tender, almost like a snow pea, these are more of the peas that you're gonna want to say for the purpose of drying and then being able to cook peas throughout the later months. These are more of your peas that you're going to want to shell and store. You can eat them while they're young, but they are definitely a good variety of pea to save for that purpose. And then we have sugar daddy peas. This is another really, really good one. It is a stringless edible potted sugar snap pea. These are very, very sweet and they have a really good shelf life. So I, I would highly recommend these. They are a semi dwarf bush variety of pea. So they only get to, what is this, 24 inches tall. So you could get away with a very small like TP sort of trellis support. I wouldn't go with no support for my peas just because then they topple over on top of one another and it just kind of creates a hazardous growing condition which isn't great for them to be the most productive plants. But this is a good variety if you don't have a lot of trellising space. Plus they're very sweet, they're very good. One of my favorite cooler weather varieties of plants has to be broccoli. I love roasted broccoli in the oven or even pan roasted broccoli. It is so good with sea salt on it. Yum. So I get really excited about growing the broccoli. Now the, I'm trying to see if I have an actual package to show you. My standard go-to broccoli is Waltham 29 broccoli. It grows well, it does a good job. It's been a solid producer. The heads don't get exceptionally big, but they do well enough. Sometimes it can have a mild blue hint to its head on it. This is just a really good variety of broccoli. It's kind of the standard tried and true variety of broccoli. So this is one that I go back to year after year is the Waltham 29. If you grow in this area and you have varieties of colder weather crops that grow really well in the South, I would love that information. I learn so much from you guys and the things that you share with me. It's a mutual relationship we have here. So please feel free to share varieties that you know that grow well in this area or that you just really love. Now I have a lot of, okay, so sometimes people call Romanesco broccoli, broccoli, but it's actually a cauliflower. It's a green variety of cauliflower and it's exceptionally beautiful. This is the artisan of broccoli or in truth cauliflower. I love this mostly because it's really, really pretty. It doesn't have any distinct different taste. Some people say it tastes slightly nuttier. I don't think my palate is quite as refined to be able to taste that difference, but it's good. It tastes good. It's beautiful to grow and it's fun. So we grow that every year as well. I just actually harvested some of that from the garden and then put it on a, a snack tray with dinner where we had cauliflower and the broccoli of the different kinds. And it was one of the first things I said to Seth, like you would never see these beautiful varieties of broccolis and cauliflowers in the grocery store. So it's really neat looking down and being like, hey, that's really cool that I grew that. And it never gets old. You garden for years and years and years and it just never gets less exciting. The two main varieties of white cauliflower that I grow that do well have to be your snowball cauliflower. This is another kind of tried and true variety of cauliflower. It produces a pretty decent sized head. It's been about six inches on average for us. I don't know what the package says anymore because it's just, I don't have a thing that tells me what it's supposed to be. That's what it's been on average, has been about six inches. It's done really well for us here. A tip when it comes to allowing your broccoli and cauliflower to come to a head is to take the leaves closest to the head and wrap it around the plant and then wrap a rubber band around it. That will help it from getting as much direct sunlight and then it will be slower to bolt. So if you've had a lot of issues with your broccoli or cauliflower separating, that's something that you can go ahead and do that'll help you to allow the plants to grow bigger without you having it separate quite so soon. 
All right, so up next is the Durgesh 41 cauliflower. This is another variety from India. It does well in the south. I mean, it's not something that you're gonna grow in the, in the summer or the late spring, but it is a variety that has a little bit more of a heat tolerance to it. So if you're struggling with a pretty high heat level in the fall or the later part of spring, this could possibly be a benefit. This has grown well. Now, Purple of Sicily cauliflower is something that I grow every year just because I love it. The heads aren't just ginormous. It's, it's said to get to like three pounds. I've never gotten one quite that big, but they are absolutely beautiful heads of cauliflower. We love those. The Green Mercietta cauliflower is another one that's really, really fun. It's just a very attractive, beautiful head of cauliflower. It's really fun to grow and harvest my bread timer. All right, so let's talk about Brussels sprouts. So the variety of Brussels sprouts that I'm growing this year is going to be the Long Island Improved Brussels sprouts. This is supposed to be a standard open pollinated heavy yields of Brussels sprouts variety. So this is what I'm going with. I'm pretty excited about it. It's supposed to do really well. Again, most of this is supposed to be done in the fall. So I'm not gonna go out and plant 102 Brussels sprouts this spring because if all of a sudden it heats up and it's really, really hot, I do not need that many seeds for Brussels sprouts, which is what I would end up getting. So we are gonna go ahead and we're gonna plant a few of these. I don't know exactly how many that will be, but we're gonna plant a few of them and we're just gonna see what happens. Best case scenario, we can get seeds and a really good harvest. Worst case scenario, we just get a bunch of seeds, but that's still pretty great. Southern Giant Curled Mustard. Southern Giant Curled Mustard has grown so well for us it's been so prolific to the point that one or two mustard plants and we're swimming in it we don't need any more which is great if you wanted to make mustard powder save the seeds grind them up and make mustard powder but the leaves are a bit spicy so they're really good on a sandwich as like a spicy lettuce addition but they're prolific they grow really well in the south one one or two plants is pretty much all you need we have this growing very prolifically in the garden right now so I'm actually not at this current moment planning on starting any more. I'm probably gonna let what I have in the garden continue to harvest and, and grow and then I'll let it go to plot and we'll save seeds from that. But this is a variety that's very good. So Vets Collards, These, this is a great kind of standard tried and true variety of collard greens. They grow really well in the South. It tolerates very poor soil, which is important if you have very sandy soil or a lot of tough clay and you wanna grow collard greens. Collard greens can be cooked a number of different ways. They are very good. My kids eat collard greens and I mean, they enjoy it. So I'm a collard green supporter. If you haven't tried cooking and growing collard greens, that's something I highly recommend. Maybe you grow them and you love them so you know what I'm talking about. But if you haven't, it's definitely worth trying. It's, it's really good. So we like that. And then you can also take leaves off of broccoli kale, cabbages, all your brassicas if you wanted to, and you can dehydrate the leaves and grind it into a green powder. Sprinkle it into eggs sometimes with the kids, and we'll call them green eggs and ham, and it's just eggs with vegetables. It's a really great way to throw vegetables in. You can put it in smoothies or other things. You can even encapsulate it if you want to and have your, I can't remember what they call it. There's these ads for these pills for fruits and vegetables that you see on TV sometimes. And it's just basically frozen, dehydrated vegetables that have been capsulized. You can do that with greens at home if you got a dehydrator. <laughs> now a free variety that we got this year that I have not tried is this old Tokyo, I need Seth to pronounce this. I'm gonna butcher it, Komatsana. I don't know what komatsama is. I haven't really eaten that. It does say that it is nutrient dense and refined in flavor. It's a spinach mustard. Interesting, tolerant of heat and frost, but best in cool spring. I don't know, maybe we'll try growing it. It looks, it just looks like a color green. So I don't know, we'll see. And then as far as kale goes, I love kale. I love dinosaur kale. I really like walking stick kale, scarlet kale, Russian kale. There's a lot of really good varieties of kale. My kale storage is actually really low right now. I'm down to the dinosaur kale. It's only the only one I've got. I'm gonna actually have to get seeds for that pretty soon or even this summer because I'm starting to run low. I've got one variety left, but kale is really good. Um, again, you can dehydrate it. It's also great in salads. You know, a few plants goes a long way if you're not a super big kale fan. Also, 
If you have growing space in your area and you can grow throughout the winter and you're not a super big fan of say mustard greens, right? Say you want to grow mustard greens, but you don't need a ton of them that can be food for your animal. So if you have chickens or goats and things like that, you can throw mustard greens over to them and they will enjoy them. So that's that's another reason to grow things. Tatsoi. I love tatsoi. Its flavor of its leaves is very similar in my opinion to spinach. It's not as waxy and as intense as spinach is. It's much, much, much mild, more milder than that. But it has, for me, just a similar flavor. It might not for you, that's okay. Um, I like to take the leaves and cut them up and throw them into salads. That's pretty much the primary way that we use them for. And then the stems, the kids and I and my husband, we put peanut butter on the stems and use it as mock celery when we don't have celery coming in from the garden. And they prefer it over celery because celery has these strings. Whereas the stems of tatsoi is, the flavor is almost non-existent. So you're kind of just eating crunchy peanut butter. It's really good. So if you haven't tried doing that and you're growing tatsoi, I highly recommend it for that purpose. <laughs> Now we grow rainbow Swiss chard in the garden, mostly because I really enjoy looking at it. It's just like spinach in my opinion. It's another spinach type variety. So all the ways that you would cook spinach or use spinach, Swiss chard can be used in all those same ways. It makes a really good spinach green pasta as well. So we're a fan of that and we're definitely growing that again. All right, so onions. I love onions. I absolutely love onions. Sometimes I'll just make onion rings on the fly because I really enjoy onions. <laughs> They're really good. We grow your standard red onions, white onions, your Spanish sweet onions. We grow a lot of different varieties of onions, but I don't actually have the seed packets in front of me, so I can't read them off for you. But the varieties off of the top of my head that I have loved have been your standard red onions and then your Spanish sweet onions. Those are really good varieties. Hi. He wanted to be a tiger today, so he has some residual tiger lines going on. Don't ya? Red acre cabbage is beautiful and it is productive without being overkill. So red acre cabbage is a really, really good one. And then on the flip side of that, you have golden acre cabbage, which is very similar. It's just these very neat, tidy heads of cabbage that grow really, really well. And then another really good cabbage variety is the Early Jersey Wakefield cabbage. These aren't super big cabbages. They're cylindrical in size and they get up to about two pounds, but they mature pretty early because they're not these really super big. Because they are smaller, they produce a lot quicker, whereas your larger heads of cabbage are gonna take a lot more time. So I think we have a pretty good shot of getting a decent harvest from the Early Jersey and possibly the Red and Gold Acre cabbages. So that's what I'm gonna stick to. I do have other varieties of cabbages and things like that that we're gonna grow next fall. But those are the ones I'm gonna stick to because I think those are my best shot for actually getting some cabbage this spring. Ooh, and this is my random seed area. So Utah celery, this is one that I am really excited to grow. We have some of this growing right now in the garden. It's doing really, really well. I enjoy celery because it's used in a lot of cooking. Your kind of base flavors for a lot of French cuisine is carrots, celery, and garlic. And onions those are kind of your base and I will say for the most part I include those in a lot of the dishes that we have especially for making soups or broths things of that nature so love celery I would highly recommend it it seems like one of those things might be odd to grow but it's actually pretty straightforward and easy so if you haven't grown it celery is one that I would recommend doing I want to make a note with the onions that I did plant the majority of our onions in November I think it was November that they got planted in now it is only January so I could probably throw some more onion seeds in the beds. And I might actually do that. I might go out and throw a whole other round of onion seeds into the beds just because we do use a lot of onions here. Um, but you just have to expect that that'll be a later harvest for you. But onions are very, very frost and cold tolerant, which is great. Now, most of my carrots are already in the garden. I did go out and put a whole bunch of carrots in just recently. I just put seeds down and we put down more black nebula carrots. This is a really dark purple carrot that is great for the anthocyanin benefits. I will say if you can these carrots, it will turn your entire jar of carrots purple. And when you're cooking with them, they will turn your hands purple. If you freeze them and cook with them, they're gonna turn everything purple. They're great for that purpose. Uh -huh. Yes. And then um, St. Valerie carrots, we did some more of those. St. Valerie's are some of my absolute favorites. Coral red carrots are also really, really good. I also like to do a variety of rainbow carrots just because it's something that I enjoy. And carrot flowers are surprisingly beautiful. They are biannuals, 
So it does take typically two seasons for a lot of varieties of carrots to bloom. I have found that in our garden, there are several that will bloom in the first year. So they make a really good filler in bouquet arrangements and for saving seeds, which I like. I like to be able to save seeds for the varieties that we're growing. So let's talk about lettuce. You wanna talk about lettuce? So one of my favorite varieties is Paris Island lettuce. This is a romaine type of lettuce that gets really, really, really big. It's probably my biggest variety of lettuce that I grow. It is very prolific in the garden. So this is just a variety that grows really well for us. It is also a variety that withstands heat a little bit more than some of my other ones. So Paris Island lettuce is kind of my go-to romaine type lettuce. It's bigger, it's gonna feed more people and it has a pretty good heat tolerance to it as well. I'm a fan of a lot of softer varieties of lettuce. You're so silly. Things like your butter bibs, we really enjoy those. I have a Marvel of Four Seasons butter bib lettuce that I absolutely love. That one's one of my favorites. And then just your traditional butter bib lettuce. It's, it's soft in texture. It's really, really good in a salad. We have a newer variety. I've grown this for about a year and a half now, Pablo lettuce. It almost forms like tiny iceberg types of lettuce and it has, so it has a decent heat tolerance as well. It does a pretty good job withstanding the heat. And then Marlowe lettuce, I love a purple Marlowe lettuce. That's a really, really good one. It's excellent, I highly recommend that. I would recommend growing something like your standard iceberg lettuce. Those take a decently long time to grow and turn into something and they like a lot of colder temperatures. So those aren't gonna do substantially well or a Landis lettuce. Landis lettuce also prefers a really cold growing temperature. So those are things you would definitely wanna do in the winter or the fall. And because nap time is over, and I think we covered a good amount of things. Do you think we covered a good amount of things? Yeah, okay. And then I think we're gonna go ahead and wrap up this particular video talking about the colder weather crops that we are going to be growing. Now, this is not going to be everything. I'm trying to cover a wide variety of different things, but there's definitely gonna be varieties in the garden tours that I'm not gonna be able to mention, but we'll see those when the garden tours kick off again. All right, guys, I will see you in the next video. Bye, y'all. You say bye. Bye. Good job. I say bye. <laughs> okay, come say bye. Bye. Mm -hmm.